The moment he shouted at our daughter, her eyes filled with tears, I realized this wasn't a rough patch anymore, it was a war zone. And I couldn't keep pretending our love was still alive. However, it wasn't just about the kids, though their arrival certainly reshaped our world in profound ways. It was something deeper, a fundamental change in how he saw me, or perhaps, in how he chose to express his feelings. I became an afterthought. Worse actually, I became an annoyance. At first, the change was slight, his smiles perfunctory and his once-frequent caresses had become rare. Every time I walked into the room, the light in his eyes seemed to go out, as though I were a burden rather than a blessing. It was a silent anguish that intensified with every apathetic look and harsh comment, hurting in ways I was unable to put into words. Our conversations, once filled with shared dreams and playful banter, became logistical exchanges primarily focused on the kids or household duties. I tried to bridge the widening gap, reaching out with tentative words of affection or attempting to initiate the kind of spontaneous intimacy that had once come so naturally to us. Each effort seemed to meet with a wall of indifference or, worse, irritation. The more I pressed, the more he withdrew, until the distance between us felt insurmountable. I could never do anything right. I was by his words, always forgetting, and lazy, for small things, such as forgetting to put leftovers in the fridge. The man who used to light up my world now cast long shadows over our home. His frustration seemed to simmer just below the surface, erupting over trivialities. He criticized more than he complimented, and what was once playful teasing now felt like pointed jabs. I recall one really depressing night. The kids had been particularly rowdy, and I had spent hours trying to settle them into bed. I entered the kitchen, exhausted, and saw him glaring icily at the shambles that had been left on the counter. He angrily asked, can't you just clean up after yourself? It felt colder here than it had outside that night. His words stung, not because of their severity, but because of what they represented, a deepening void filled with resentment and misunderstanding. I looked at him, really looked, and saw a stranger where my husband used to be. The air in our house grew thick with unspoken resentments, and as much as I tried to penetrate the silence, my efforts seemed to only drive us further apart. His moods became a barometer for our daily life, unpredictable and often stormy. His words hurt, but more than his words did when he was grouchy, which was most of the time these days. There was an underlying coldness about him that permeated every part of our house. So obviously over time, I don't really feel safe with him, or even enjoy hanging out with him. The irony is that I love him so much that I want to be physically intimate with him because he's great in bed and selfless. But I just don't desire him. He's not kind to me or the kids when he's grumpy which is most of the time. I tried to explain, to tell him how much I missed him, how much I missed us. We could have a perfect life, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Just be happy, enjoy us. That's all I want, kind words, no criticism, small touches. We'd be having so much sex. But nah, that's too hard. What he's decided to do is withdraw. Give up. Marriage light he calls it. No talking. No interaction. If he doesn't get sex, he's going to just do the bare minimum, for the family. Because sex comes first, then he'll be nice. Smart guy but he's literally doing the opposite and saying that's the solution to his lack of sex problem. With a look of discouragement or even contempt, he shook his head. He turned his back on me and whispered. It's not that simple. And it was then that I understood that the everyday affirmations of love and respect that had been steadily eroding were the answer, something he either failed to perceive or was unable to understand. Even though I don't want a divorce, it's clear that we are moving toward one. It was clear that we were spiraling toward an end neither of us had envisioned on our wedding day, driven there by lost connections and unmet needs. The irony was that, although we both desired intimacy, we were unable to bridge the widening gap. Update. One evening, as I was setting the table for dinner, our youngest, Mia, accidentally knocked over a glass of water. The sound of shattering glass echoed like a gunshot in the tense air. I held my breath, bracing for his reaction. True to the new norm, he stormed into the kitchen, his face contorted with frustration. Can't you kids do anything right? He snapped at her. Mia, only seven, her eyes wide and brimming with tears, recoiled as if the words were physical blows. I rushed to her side, but the damage was done. She was shaking, a small scared shadow of the bubbly child she once was. That night, after I had tucked Mia into bed and soothed her fears, I confronted him. You can't keep doing this to the kids, I said, my voice firm despite the trembling I felt inside. They're afraid of you. You're supposed to be their protector, their hero, and you're turning into the monster under their bed. He paused, and for a moment I thought I saw a flicker of realization in his eyes. But it passed quickly, and he shrugged off my concerns. They need to learn discipline, he said, his voice devoid of the warmth I once loved. I'm not going to tiptoe around them. The chasm between us widened with his every dismissive remark. I found myself wondering how the man I had fallen so deeply in love with could now look at me, at his own children, with such indifference and irritation. Our home had become a battlefield, our interactions mined with potential triggers for his temper. The situation escalated one afternoon when I found him berating our son, Lucas, for not finishing his homework. 
His tone was harsh, his words sharp, and I saw in Lucas the same fear that had gripped Mia. I stepped in, unable to hold back any longer. Stop it, just stop, I shouted, they're just children, you're tearing them apart. He turned on me then, his anger no longer contained. And what about you, he retorted. You're so busy defending them, you don't see the stress I'm under, you don't see me at all. I realized then that this was more than just a rough patch. We were at a breaking point. His unwillingness to seek joy with us, his relentless negativity. It wasn't just pushing me away, it was affecting our children deeply. Each day left emotional scars, and I feared the long-term effects it would have on them. The home that once held laughter and love now felt oppressive, a place where joy was suffocated under the weight of constant criticism and discontent. Edit. I'm not here for advice despite the flair. Twenty years is a long time to build a life with someone. It's enough time to knit together countless memories, share dreams, and intertwine lives. When I met him, I was in my early twenties, and he was everything I thought I wanted, charismatic, confident, with a smile that could light up a room. We fell into love as easily as one might fall into a dream, swept away by the promise of a future together. But dreams, I've learned, don't always hold up in the harsh light of day. As the years passed, the man I married seemed to retreat behind a facade I no longer recognized, replaced by someone whose warmth had cooled, whose kindness had soured into criticism. What had once been a partnership began to feel more like a prolonged battle, with each of us in our respective trenches, no longer fighting together but against one another. In an effort to bridge the gap, I suggested marriage counseling. It was a desperate grasp at what remained of us, a lifeline thrown into the turbulent waters of our failing relationship. Initially, he agreed, albeit reluctantly. But it was short-lived. After only a few sessions, he dismissed the entire endeavor. There's no point paying someone to tell us what I already know, he said, his voice edged with the kind of defeat that suggested he saw no future in trying. He believed the counselor was just echoing sentiments that were already palpable between us. Undeterred I scheduled another session, this time, I knew I would likely be going alone. It felt symbolic, this solitary act, a representation of the loneliness that had crept into my marriage, filling up the spaces where laughter and love used to live. Attending the on-demand marriage counseling session alone was a poignant experience. The decision to go by myself was not easy, but necessary. The office was the same, the couch familiar, yet everything felt different. Without him there, the space seemed larger, almost echoing the emptiness I felt. The counselor, a kind and perceptive woman, greeted me with a gentle nod, her eyes reflecting understanding that today was going to be a different kind of session. As I sat down, I felt an odd mix of relief and apprehension. Relief because I could speak freely without worrying about his reactions or the immediate tension his presence often brought. Apprehension, because going alone underscored the seriousness of our disconnection. It was as if his absence in the session mirrored the growing void in our relationship. The session started with the counselor asking simple questions about how I had been feeling. Speaking without him there, I found my words flowed more easily. There was no need to look over, to gauge his reaction or to temper my words to keep the peace. I talked about the loneliness, the sadness of feeling unpartnered in what was supposed to be a lifelong partnership. I shared the yearning for kindness, the need for a space where I wasn't constantly critiqued but understood and accepted. The counselor listened intently, occasionally guiding the conversation deeper into my feelings of disillusionment and loss. She asked about what happiness looked like for me now, in the current context of my life. This question stumped me, I had been so focused on trying to salvage whatever was left of our marriage that I hadn't stopped to consider what my own happiness might look like independently of him. We explored the dynamics that had led to our current state. Discussing these without him there allowed me to be more honest, more forthright about my grievances without fear of escalation. The counselor helped me see how my people-pleasing tendencies might have enabled some of the dynamics that were so painful now. We talked about setting boundaries, about the importance of self-care and self-respect in any relationship. The session came to an end and I felt lighter. It wasn't as though my problems vanished magically but more like I started to see things clearly. By sharing my fears and worries openly, I felt stronger. Yes, the feeling of being alone was still present, but with it came a newfound courage, realization of my own needs, and the understanding that it's okay to pursue a life that meets those needs. Leaving the counselor's office, I felt a stark contrast to the times I had left it with him by my side. Previously, each session was followed by a silence, sometimes resentful, sometimes exhausted. We would leave together but more divided, each of us retreating into our own corners of pain and misunderstanding. This time, I left feeling a sense of individual purpose. The path forward was not yet clear, but the journey felt like my own. Reflecting on our two decades together, I've come to realize that the foundation of our relationship was flawed in ways I hadn't seen, or perhaps hadn't wanted to see. I have always been a people pleaser, a trait that made it easy for me to overlook slights, to forgive without amends, to absorb the brunt of his frustrations without complaint. I thought this was resilience, perhaps even a form of love. But there is only so much one can bear before realizing that what is being carried is not shared weight but a unilateral burden. Now, as I contemplate attending counseling alone, it feels like both an end and a beginning. It's an admission that while I can work on myself, I can't force him to engage with me in this process. 
The love I have for him persists, a stubborn flame not easily extinguished even by years of hardship. Yet, loving him no longer means sacrificing my own well-being. I've fallen out of love with the man he has become, even as I cling to the memory of the man he once was. The mutual respect, compassion, and kindness I yearn for are fundamental, yet they seem like foreign concepts to him now. My hope for a free space, where mistakes are met with understanding rather than contempt, feels like a modest ask in the grand scheme of a shared life. Yet, it's become a cornerstone of what I need to thrive, not just survive. As I face the possibility of attending counseling alone, it's not just the unraveling of our relationship that occupies my thoughts, but the reconstruction of my own sense of self. It's about reclaiming my right to a life where respect and kindness are not just occasional graces but consistent presences. Whether this path leads to reconciliation or separation remains unclear, but what is certain is my commitment to seeking a better, healthier way forward, for myself, and hopefully, for our children too. I used to be a people pleaser, but then I've realized life is short and I deserve a free space to make mistakes and do my own thing.